Wow, beautiful morning already. I, I've spoken to a few people this morning and I feel like one thing after the other. I've, I was here the first Sunday in January, but it's actually felt like a while since I was here regularly on a Sunday because of illness in the family. And I just want to thank you. I want to start by thanking you for praying for Wesley last week. He is much better. But can you now pray for Ezra? Because he is not very well, hence why John and the boys are not here this morning. It's oh, hard going, but we are thankful that we are living in this country and we have access to health care and food and water and all that. So praise God for that. Oh, but what a beautiful morning together in, in God's presence already. And this morning, I want to share with you a message that God has been kind of working in me over the last couple of months um, on a personal level, but also, as is usually the case, it's something that has a wider application to the, the bride of Christ. Um, and also aware, I've just been very conscious as I was planning this, there may be words that I say, and if you are new to faith or anything, and you are like, what on earth is she going on, the bride of Christ, what is that? Come and ask was at the end of the service if there's anything you need clarification on so we can um, unpack it a bit more. I don't want you leaving thinking I have no idea what she just spoke on for the last however long. Um, but I want to set, start by saying I'm not a teacher. I'm not like Pete or Claire who brings this great in-depth uh, Bible teaching. The messages I bring are usually of a more prophetic nature um, and that's where we're, we're at today. And I was originally meant to bring this message in December when I got ill <laughs> and then run, with, had the course of illness in the family. And I was kind of working through whether it was the right message to bring at the time. And although I'm not thankful that we had illness in our house, I am thankful that the Lord kept me back from bringing it until this point because there has been more that he's unpacked over the last few weeks of prayer and fasting and consecration as we've been working through it as a church. Um, so... I was also actually not meant to be bringing the word today, but I uh, spoke to Pete <laughs> last Sunday. I was like, actually, I feel like I should be bringing the word this morning. And it's the message that perhaps I was slightly running from um, because there's some things in it that I was a bit like, I don't want to have to be the person to bring this. <laughs> so have a bit of grace <laughs> this morning. Um, I will start by telling you a dream I've had. Now then, the word that I will bring this morning will be rooted in scripture. So don't worry, I'm not going to go a little bit, oh, we're preaching on a dream. Um, but the Lord often speaks to me in dreams and interpretations. And this dream he gave to me uh, in October last year. Um, and I am sorry, but the imagery in this dream is perhaps not one that you want to linger on for very long. So we'll move on quite quickly from it. But in this dream, we were, I say we, it was myself, John, my family. But I I'm trying to remember, I think it was also church family were there, and we were in the conference center, and there was an event, and as it unfolded, the event happened to be a sort of vow renewal ceremony between myself and John. So we were already married, we'd had our wedding a few years before we'd got children, and we were renewing our vows. And I was in a wedding dress, um, Hence why I knew it was quite a special, <laughs> special occasion. And we were trying to find a toilet for myself and Solomon. Um, Solomon's my son, for those who don't know. And we went on this journey to find a toilet in this dream. A little bit stressful with young children, if you've ever been there and they need a wee. Um, and the whole family came with me. And we found this family toilet room and we went in. And um, we went in and I looked to the side and there was a mirror on the wall. And I looked at the mirror, I looked at myself, and I could see myself in this wedding dress. It was different to the one that I wore when I got married. And as I looked at myself, I thought, I look different. I look more beautiful. I, I look lighter in myself. And I just made that acknowledgement about how I looked. Not that I didn't look beautiful on the first wedding day, but there was something different about this one. Um, and then I turned, we found a toilet, and I leant over this toilet and opened my mouth, and out of my mouth came a load of brown water. So I'm sorry for the imagery, but that's the way it was. And it wasn't vomit, you'll be thankful to hear. Um, it was just water pouring out, more than a mouthful could hold. And as I leant over, it came coming out and coming out in just, just a non-stop. Um, it wasn't uncomfortable, but it did taste bitter. 
so the taste of the water was bitter. And when I woke up, the dream itself was actually in a wider dream that made no sense, so I don't think it had any application. But I remember thinking, wow, there's something in that one. And as I prayed, um, I felt the Lord bring the interpretation of cleansing is coming to his bride. And while she may look and feel good, I would say this morning has looked, it's felt good, it's felt beautiful, it's felt slightly different. There is still stuff within that needs to be brought out and cleansed out. And the truth of it is, it will taste bitter. Okay? I kind of brought this uh, dream when I first had it to the rest of the oversight team. I think it was David made the observation. He was like, it's interesting that you were there with your whole family in this room. And as we kind of discussed it a bit more, I was like, yeah, that makes sense. It's a whole family affair. It's not just one person doing the work to bring out the, the dirt within. It's everyone. It's old and young. It's all generations have to be prepared for this cleansing. And I had actually forgotten about this dream until a couple of weeks ago. Um, I think we watched a prophetic word on um, some, uh, what the Lord's saying over this next coming year. And it just brought my memory back to the dream. And I was like, ah, now's the time to bring it to the wider church. And if you were here at the engine room last week, you'll have heard it. And we prayed into the themes quite a bit. Um, but I, I felt after the engine room, I was like, the rest of the church need to hear it. We can't just keep it for the people who came that evening. The rest of the church need to hear this. Um, so that is why <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm bringing this message today, because I feel uh, in, the, in the spirit that there's a sense of urgency about each of our own individual responsibilities to work through the dirt that might be still within that God wants to bring out. So it's not just the responsibility of the, the leaders in the church or a few um, intercessors or people who may have a bit more time to spend uh, in the day in, in prayer or in study. It is for every single one of us to take hold of the fact that we are the bride. We have been in this time since uh, we... Um, first met in the first Sunday of January of consecration as a church, and I'm aware, as we've seen, the, uh, the citywide prayer is um, focusing on consecration, so there are many other churches who are wor working through this. Um, but I'm aware that there may be some, in fact, we had a conversation the other day, that don't fully understand what consecration is. It's a, a bit of a, a, a word that is said without much unpacking and even myself I had to when I was researching and preparing for this morning I had to be like okay do I really understand what consecration is um, but the the short of it is it's the process of setting yourself apart for the Lord and it's setting yourselves apart from the world so for the Lord and from the world and it's the separation of yourself from that which the world seems good, but to God, it's abhorrent, it's repulsive, it's, it's dirty, it's not holy, so it can't be in his presence. And um, if you're interested in the, the biblical kind of concept of consecration, back in the Old Testament, it's referred to time and time again when the Lord calls his people to come back to him. But it's often marked with the washing of the body and with garments and clothes, which is quite significant in those times with access to clean water. It was a, a big moment. Um, but it's a representation outwardly of what God actually wants to happen inwardly. And so even in, um, if you look at uh, Joel chapter 2, um, that in itself is Old Testament, but he, God has called his people to a time of consecration. Um, but he says, rend your hearts, not your garments. And so that is where we're at in this season. Um, it's an examination and the cleansing of our hearts so we can be dedicated and we can be undefiled for God. And so I feel like perhaps we are 
should have caveated this whole season that we're going on as a church. That if you're not left feeling uncomfortable, then perhaps you're not quite doing the work of consecration that God wants to be bringing. Um, it's going to be an uncomfortable time because it's, uh, it's revealing what's within our hearts that's not pleasing God. And if you want to serve the Lord, then anything that stands against that should make us feel uncomfortable if we've partnered with it. And just for practical examples, Pete gave some last week. So you can't go to a midweek family group and then the next day you're going out into town getting drunk with your friends. Um, there's lifestyle choices you can make that set you apart. Um, another example, you can't spend the morning in worship like this and then go home and at the first frustration find your mouth swearing because it's a revealing of actually what's going on in the depths of your heart. But... I think it's often the case that we can easily judge those things that are the obvious lifestyle things that we can change and we can repent of. There are often habits and comforts and mindsets and attitudes that are a little bit more acceptable in the body of Christ because they're just not as obvious. Um, and so an example would be turning to food to fill an emotional gap. Um, or your choice of entertainment in an evening when you want to unwind. Or even, this has been a challenge for me last year, um, your insecurities that actually are rooted in pride because we think we have to be perfect rather than allowing the grace of God to come and fill our imperfections and our weaknesses. And one of the ones that I want to kind of unpack a bit more today that I think we struggle with as a society is our addiction to comfort. So when it comes to consecration, we will not put in the work that is needed to consecrate ourselves if we're choosing comfort because consecration is uncomfortable. It's the bringing out of that which is not pleasant, it's not nice, it's not honoring to God. And there are things that we perhaps have chosen to hide away within ourselves because of the fear of the discomfort that we're going to have to feel when we're addressing them. Um, things like heart issues, forgiveness, bitterness, or um, yeah, things like that. Um, I'm going to ask a question you don't need to answer, unless you want to. Um, <laughs> when posed with the, the call at the start of the year to fast and to pray, how many of you went within yourself, yes, I get to fast? I'm not thinking as many. <laughs> because fasting itself is uncomfortable. It is the taking away, the humbling of things that we're used to to dedicate a set time before God. And the same is his thought in spending time in prayer for by many. It's an uncomfortable place for many to go into that place of prayer and push past the uncomfortable time until God's presence comes. Our love of comfort um, prevents us from bringing a full sacrifice of praise and worship that will move the heart of God. We can be willing to come here on a Sunday morning, as demonstrated this morning by the beautiful time we've had in worship already, and we can be led in singing. But if we are not prepared to look undignified in worship, we're choosing comfort. If we are happy to raise our voices, maybe even raise our hands, but the call to step out even beyond that is too much because it's not in our tradition, it's not in what we understand, it's not in what, how we've practiced worship before. It could be that we're choosing comfort instead of giving God the fullness of our praise and our worship. We are called to give a sacrifice of praise. And I wonder if any of you have ever asked the Lord if your worship moves him. Because it would be a very sorry thing for us to think just singing a song is enough to move his heart when he's called us to make that sacrifice and lay things down before him in a way that costs us. And in fact, it didn't actually move his heart. 
And we then need to ask ourselves if the answer that we hear back is a no, are we willing to go on that journey of discomfort, of working through whether or not he is worthy of us pushing past our comfort levels, of pushing past our traditions, our, our practices, the things that we've been rooted in our understanding of what worship is and the way we worship, when he may be saying, actually, you've never come to me and asked me how I want you to worship. This, uh, this season, this January, um, we've been in prayer and fasting, we're still there. This, this is the first time I have ever prayed and fasted for this length of time with this level of commitment when it comes to fasting. Um, so I've prayed and fasted before, oh, pray all the time, but I've fasted before over certain seasons. Um, but because of, usually because of pregnancy or, or feeding children or whatnot, I've always made a reason I can't fast fully from food right now. Um, it's just my body is needed <laughs> for my children. Uh, so I can't fast, so I've stripped back other things, uh, entertainment, social media, various things that were still filling my life, but never to the extent of where I've been walking through this month. Um, so I started the month, we had a three-day juice-only fast, which was intense for me, having not done that before, um, and then moved on to um, just fruit and vegetables. And, oh, man, I miss food that actually tastes decent. <laughs> I miss it. I'm just counting down the days to next Sunday when um, I'm going to break it uh, with a, such a celebration with John. Anyway, <laughs> food, if you don't know myself and my husband, John, food is one of our big things. Like, that's how we connect on a, a deep emotional level <laughs> is by a good, good meal. Anyway, <laughs> um, so... Yeah, this, this month I've, I've stripped it right back and it has been painful, not in terms of the physical side, but I feel like I've come through the other side of something, um, but for the first week and a half I was miserable and... John will attest to that. Like, in fact, we were both miserable. It was not a nice place to be in our house at that point in time. But I had this depth of realisation that my joy, my source of joy, was food. And my source of entertainment and distraction in the day was anything that I could look at or consume to distract myself from the fact that actually when I stripped it all back, my life felt very empty. And the God that I was saying was my source, I'd fit around the edges. And I had wanted to say that he was the source of my joy and the taking away of the things that I like to eat and the, the entertainment that I like to relax to just left that gap of, wow, okay, I filled my life with idols that I never even realized were idols because they're acceptable in our life. Food is acceptable. It's an acceptable part of our daily life. And I had to ask myself, in that time of misery, <laughs> as I would call it, do I really want God, or do I just want my food back? And do I really want God, or do I just want this time of fasting to end so I can bring back the things that were already in my life that were actually distracting myself from the reality that every day I'm not seeing the fullness of his glory being poured out on me and not seeing a soul saved to the extent that we're reading in Acts. And I just I had to repent because I realized how proud of, I was being to assume that I was living a life that was worthy of being called the spotless bride of Christ when I was expecting God to fit around those edges. Can we get... Is there a, a slide, I think, with the passage from James? Um, I have been reading through the book of James. I don't know how, when I first started, but it's been months, if I'm honest. And if you've read James before, you realize it's not that long. It's only five chapters long. But I, it's my favorite book of the Bible because there's so much in it about how we should live. Um, and I was taking the time to intentionally go through um, the chapters, often taking a week at a time on just a, a short chunk and realizing I need to 
hold this up as a mirror against me and say, Lord, come and, come and speak and show me what is in me that this uh, scripture is, is working through. I think it can be often for us, uh, it's easy for us to read scripture and just assume that we're putting it into practice because we feel quite good about our lives. We feel like it's okay. Or we can use it to hold the mirror up against someone else that we're like, oh, you're not hitting the mark. But then we don't always take the time to do it to ourselves. And in James chapter 5, verse 5, there's just this short phrase um, that says, we have fattened our hearts in the day of slaughter. And this felt very apt to me when I was realizing that food was a, a big, big thing in my life. But I've, it just brought me to mind, everything in our Western culture is about excess and abundance. You know, our lifestyles are so cultivated um, so that, in our homes, we have time-saving devices that are meant to save us time so that we can then fill it with entertainment and pleasure and enjoyment. And oh, there's so many like, options out there now for entertainment that it's almost overwhelming and you don't know what to choose because uh, there's so many. And we can spend our entire life going from one thing to the next trying to fill that space that the time-saving devices have taken away from us. Um, and we consume far more than we're ever even created to be consuming now. And the reality is we've shifted in this culture to the point that work, hard work, discomfort becomes an inconvenience for our own pleasure. We're constantly seeking when's the next time that we can sit down and have a rest and have a, a, a time of pleasure and enjoyment. And it's leaked its way into our walk as followers of Christ. Inconvenience and things that don't always bring joy, um, they become the things that we want to work through quickly because they're making us uncomfortable. For example, now I know many of you do this regularly, we are called as followers of Jesus to pray for our leaders in our country, in our nation, our king, our prime minister. We should pray for them regularly. But how often is it that we remember that we should be praying and offer up a quick prayer and think, oh, that's okay, I've prayed for them, instead of thinking, oh, I need to spend time in the presence of God and ask him how he wants me to pray and actually get to that place of laboring in prayer so that we can actually then access a point in the spirit where he can work even more. I mean, I don't know about you, I'm not political like... <laughs> I hate politics. <laughs> John, John's biggest, well, not one of his biggest, but one of the challenges in mine and John's uh, relationship at the start was his family are very passionate and interested in politics and discussing those sorts of things. And I was just like, I just don't know. I'm not really that interested, if I'm honest. I think they've all missed the mark and they should be Jesus followers instead. Um, you know, get a name out. <laughs> but... Um, we look out at the political scene at the moment, and it's a mess. <laughs> it's a mess. It's men and women after their own gain without actually thinking about how it's impacting people on a wider sphere of things. And part of that comes down to the fact that the bride of Christ has not taken up her responsibility to sit in that place of discomfort and prayer for long enough to then impact those political spheres. And it can apply to so many other spheres of life. We're not yet in that place where we've exercised our spiritual muscles in prayer. How many of you, if I say, can you pray for three hours straight? would be like, yeah, that's easy. I couldn't. I'd love to. I'd love to be able to do that, but it's hard going. But that's because we've not put in the work of discomfort to get past the point of knowing sometimes you've got to press in the discomfort and the feeling tired and the flesh before God's spirit then breaks through and it becomes light and you're praying in the spirit. I'm going to read a passage from Matthew 25, if it can uh, come on the screen. So this is known as the parable of the ten virgins. And um, it's Matthew 25, verses 1 to 13, I'll read. 
And it says, at the time, the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. The foolish ones took their lamps but did not take any oil with them. The wise ones, however, took oil in jars along with their lamps. The bridegroom was a long time in coming and they all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight, the cry rang out, here's the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all the virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish ones said to the wise, give us some of your oil, our lamps are going out. No, they replied, there may not be enough for both of us and you. Instead, go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourselves. But while they were on their way to buy the oil, the bridegroom arrived Virgins who were, the virgins who were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later, the others also came. Lord, Lord, they said, open the door for us. But he replied, truly I tell you, I don't know you. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know the day or the hour. Around ten years ago, I was a student at Bible College in Derbyshire. It's where myself and John, my husband, met. Um, I'm originally from a town uh, called Macclesfield, which is south of Manchester. Um, In case anyone was wondering why I pronounce my words correctly, I'm just going to aim that one at my uh, in-laws over there (laughs) who mock me relentlessly for the way that I speak. Um, (laughs) But I have a distinct memory of uh, my time there. And a moment where the passage of the wise and foolish builders um, was suddenly brought to life for me. Um, Now, I've grown up in the church all my life. I could probably count on one one hand how many Sundays I've missed for various reasons. (laughs) It's it's been that consistent. And I am so thankful that my parents did that. And I've grown up hearing and reading Bible stories and the teachings of Jesus. Um, But believe it or not, it was 20 years into that journey that the reality of what Jesus was teaching in the the parable of the wise and foolish builders actually hit me and made me think, because I had assumed that because I was a Christian, I followed Jesus, I'd got a really great upbringing, and I'd made my own commitment to follow him five years earlier, that these things automatically meant that I was the wise builder. And it required very little on my part. All I had to do was believe in Jesus and I'd be okay. Um, and in very simple terms, yes, there's childlike faith, which is it's beautiful, but it's also the faith of someone on spiritual milk. Um, and I just have this memory of myself stood in the dining hall at university and I'm feeling the Holy Spirit saying, Rebecca, you need to check yourself and actually ask yourself the question of what are you building your life on? Is it God himself or is it something else? And I I say that because a similar thing has happened with this parable of the ten virgins recently. I've assumed that because of my faith, I have enough oil. Um, But the reality is they all started out with oil It was just the wise ones, the five wise ones brought extra and they'd put in the work beforehand to make sure they had enough. I am not about to go into the different theologies of whether it's once saved, always saved or not, but I I want to draw attention instead to the present day and how the acts of our today determine our tomorrow. So... As the bride of an eternal bridegroom, we ought to be taking the perspective that our present day actions, the here and now, also have an eternal impact. And as the body, we, may, we must understand the times that we're in now, right now, and what the Lord is doing. And even if we're tempted to grow drowsy, we have to ensure that we're prepared ourselves so when the Lord calls upon us to wake up, we have our lamps ready and burning bright. The, the story of the extra oil can be interpreted as various things, um, studying the word, bringing, building intimacy with Christ, but I, I feel for this particular season that the oil itself is the act of consecrating ourselves. 
It's the work of following the call of Christ in this hour to ensure that our heart issues are dealt with and that the things that we're tempted to put in the place of God are stripped away and repented of. The entire landscape of where we are on earth in this time and, and in the spirit has shift, uh, shifted dramatically in the last few years. Um, we're in a time of shaking. I don't know if anyone has feel, felt like they're being shook and a bit unsteady and a bit like I need to find my balance in everything that's happening. But the reality is the shaking is going to happen until the bride of Christ becomes unshakable until she has stood herself on the solid rock rather than the things that she had thought were okay and thought were the rock, but were actually comforts or lifestyles that were just accepted. But God is saying, you never asked me if that was right. You never asked me if that was of me and okay. And for as long as we're attempting to cling to our comfort in anything that is not God, the longer that shaking is going to continue. We're in a season of maturing as the bride, and you don't mature through comfort. The best times where I found myself coming out of a situation of feeling like I've learned a lot, I've matured a lot through that, has been the times of intense discomfort. And the church itself in this nation has been established for nearly a 1,500 years, um, but we're still infants in a way for the fact that we felt like we've been shaken and we're a bit wobbly when things happen shows a level of infan infancy in us. And our stamina in the spirit when it comes to prayer is weak. A few weeks ago, I, um, I came away from a Sunday gathering and I felt a depth of grief and I had this question going round and round in my mind. How can we be the remnant if we're not willing to remain? And that's in his presence, to remain in prayer and to remain in worship to the point of reaching the place where the presence of God falls. And that's different from when the worship and the singing feels great. There's a difference in the spirit because we can get to that point of singing and singing together and it feeling like we're all of one accord and great, but God's not yet poured out his presence because he knows what's in our hearts. And if we're not willing to remain until that point, we can see it when we struggle to go past a certain time in worship because in reality, we're hungry. We wanna go home and have lunch. We're now at the point where we said we'd go to church on a Sunday morning, but it's now kind of creeping into our afternoons. And if I'm honest, I'm not sure whether I'm yet prepared to spend that time. And you may have a different perspective. I'm sure we all different, bring different <laughs> ideas into this. But for me, if the Spirit of God has not fallen when we're gathering together in worship as people and as believers, I feel like we've almost wasted the morning together. Because that should be our goal, to ascend the hill of the Lord, to go up into his presence. And if we don't make it, I'm like, are we going to put in the work and the discomfort of getting there, or are we just going to go home? And I want to say that I am a parent of young children, and I know there's, <laughs> there's often reasons why individuals and people, families can't always stay. But it's the attitude, the heart position in it all, and the longing for God's presence. I believe there are times when the Lord will hold back his full outpouring of what he wants to do when we gather corporately and also in our individual prayer times at home because he's weighing our hearts to see if it is him in his fullness that we truly want. Do we want him and everything that comes with that or do we just want that feeling of, oh, we've reached it because it was a really good time together in the morning. But then when it goes on a bit too long, we'd actually rather, we'd rather go home because we've got a busy week coming and we need to get time to be prepared and do the dishes and eat lunch and we've got guests coming in the evening and I've not even hoovered the carpets yet. 
if that's the attitude, then I feel like we've missed it. But also we need to consecrate ourselves in this season because God is about to move. And when he does, and the unconsecrated parts of our hearts and our lives, they will show and they, they will hurt us even more, I think. They, they will... I keep having this picture when I'm thinking about this of pottery. And I know Pete brought the word of the potter's clay the other week, but if you've ever made a pot on a potter's wheel you will, and then put it in the kiln, you'll know that the weak spots are the ones that are more likely to break the pot when it's put into the fire. And that is the same with the unconsecrated parts of our hearts. If we are willing to let them stay, that when fires come, they're going to be the bits that break us rather than making ourselves pure and perfectly formed in his presence. And I said, I said before, I felt the grief on that Sunday morning. And that same evening, I was, I was set out to lead the engine room at time of intercessory prayer. And it's, we gather once a month to pray and to intercede. And there are many of you who come faithfully to that. And that evening, I knew that we had another event on in the evening. We, a few of you had given apologies. It was December. It's hard for many to come out in the dark in the evening in December. And there were many who were ill as well. But in a church of 100 regular attenders, not one person came to join in prayer. And I'm sorry, but I cry every time I think about this because we're the bride. And if we can look out at the world outside and say it's falling apart and the world is in deep darkness, but we're not even prepared to give one hour in prayer together in an evening in a month, I don't feel like we have the right to complain almost, because we've not actually grasped our responsibility and our authority of what we're called to do as the bride. We have the responsibility to pray. We have the responsibility to turn the events that we're looking at on the news because of our prayer. And if we are not in the place where you fully believe that yet. I just encourage you to be in that place of praying together with people to feel your faith build. Because it's in those spaces that you then get the testimonies of how God's changed things and how God's moved. And I'm not bringing this to make anyone feel like they're being told off. We're not at school. We each have lives that we have to to live and responsibilities and we have it all. I want you to know my heart in this. I love you all so dearly and I want you to know that. But our attitudes and our priorities determine who we serve as Lord. I just I feel such a weight of concern, particularly on that evening for the state of the bride and her heart. And I wept, I stayed for that at that time and I wept and I prayed, starting with myself for the state of my own heart because God revealed to me, my heart is hard. And the reality is I, I long to be able to go out and to preach the gospel to people and to see converts. But when I had it really in front of me, I just saw the lack of love that I had right there that I knew I needed and it was because of a hardened heart. And we need to be praying that our hearts are soft and so soft that we're prepared to then deal with what God brings to us. And we're prepared to then share the message of life to people who need it. There was just a sense of have we allowed the oil in our lamps to go out? Have we tended them enough to keep the fire burning? And I've been, I want to say, I've been encouraged by what I've seen over the last month and the, the time of prayer and consecration and people who've come to those times where we've gathered corporately, but also the time you've done kind of in your own time at home because it's showing God's softening hearts. <laughs> There's a testimony in itself. I've prayed for our hearts to be softened and it's, it's working. God is working. He's softening our hearts. But we have to understand the power and authority that we fully hold when we pray. 
because we're in a time where it's needed. The water that the bride brought out in the dream that I shared at the start tasted bitter. And the acknowledgement and the cleansing of it, all that is unholy before the Lord should taste bitter to us. Because it shows us of our need for his grace and our need for his mercy. I, I don't want you to go away from this morning feeling like, oh, that, that was really heavy. <laughs> like she's just been kind of almost telling us off. I don't want you to feel like that. I want you to hear my heart. There is a call from the Lord in this current day, this very moment that we have to take our individual responsibility to hear what God is saying, to assess our hearts fully, even the things that we thought were okay and perhaps aren't, and consecrate ourselves before the Lord because he, we are his bride and he is our bridegroom. And when he returns, he's coming for a bride who is pure and spotless. And that can only happen if we've put in the work to make sure that we're pure and we're spotless. And there is grace that comes from Jesus to ensure that that can happen, which is just so redemptive. There's grace that he's extending to us in the moment that says, my child, the things that you've kept hidden in your hearts for so long have come out, have to come out now. You know, you can't go where I need you to go in this world, holding on to the pains or the bitterness or the sin or the regrets of the past that we have kept nicely hidden from view. They have to come out now so that we can be seen as the ones that are unshakable when shaking happens and then people can see us and be like, okay, something's different about you because this massive event has happened in the news and you're unfazed, you're unshaken because you know where you stand and I need that. And that's the whole purpose of consecration. It's not for us necessarily, but for the people who don't yet know Jesus as their savior. You know, instead he meets us with our, and our weaknesses with his grace. And I've said before one morning, it's his grace in our weaknesses where his power is then seen. You know, and it may be painful and it will have a cost. But I ask you, is he worth it to be the consecrated bride where the satisfaction that we gain in this life is the same one that then can continue into eternity because it's not based on the things of the earth or the offers of the world. We can then work, walk through the trials and the fires that life then brings, knowing that we've been purified and we can burn bright instead of be consumed because we're no longer constrained by the things of the earth. John um, showed me the other day a clip, uh, just a short video clip that had been taken from a sermon of a church over in America who were also talking about prayer and fasting. And the revelation that they'd had from the Lord, <clears throat> particularly around fasting, that they are standing now on yesterday's fasts. And there are people in this room who I guarantee you are only sat here today saved because there have been parents or grandparents or teachers or colleagues who have spent time in that place of discomfort and prayed and fasted for you. And how much more should that then spur us on to take responsibility for the next generations of people who are to come to pray and to fast and to lay aside our own comforts because of what we're going to gain or what the kingdom is going to gain. Oh, just imagine spending eternity stood next to someone worshipping who because of the discomfort you went through in this life and the fast that you went through in this life, they're sharing eternity with you because you put in the work of discomfort. The momentary discomfort of prayer and fasting and consecration is nothing in comparison to the joy that's coming for the ones that have humbled themselves and consecrated themselves before him. And so as I draw to a close, and if the band could come up, I want us to think about what it would look like to be the consecrated bride in her fullness that the Lord is calling us to be. 
What does it look like to live in a way unhindered and not affected by the grass of the world? The marker of the consecrated bride in the years to come is the ability to stand in joy and in praise when the rest of the world is in despair. And the very purpose of that joy, as I've just said, is not to keep it to ourselves in a holy huddle on a Sunday morning. The purpose of that joy is to go out and to be a shining light into all the nations. And it says, look, the world is in deep darkness, but we know the one who has created the very stars in space. We sang about it this morning. We know the one who is brighter than the sun that we can't even look at without it burning our eyes. And we know the one who is bigger and brighter than that. And we are saved and we're protected by the one who is above all things. And because we have worked ourselves in that deep work of separating ourselves through the thing, from the things of the earth to be pure and spotless, you know when we watch the news, it won't spur us into depression or despair. It will spur us into prayer. And the medical diagnosis that we'll, we'll hear of they won't become a time of weeping. There'll be a time of thanksgiving and praise because we have an opportunity to show the world the miraculous power of a healing God. You know, the persecutions and mockeries that we may receive for our faith, there'll be a chance for Christ to stand with us and protect us from whatever fiery furnace that the world may try and throw us into. I want to imagine a consecrated bride where pride is no longer a stumbling block and move against comfort and choosing comfort over presence. And it sees us walking in deeper levels of glory. I want to imagine homes that are bursting with people because we've put in the discomfort of being like, okay, our home is small, it's crowded, but I'm going to invite all these people over because some of them know Jesus and some of them don't. But we've put in the work to be able to put ourselves past the comfort zone and torn down the walls of our own fear and our own insecurity so that those people who don't know Jesus are then given the opportunity to hear about him and hear about what he's done for them and what he can still do. You know, it could all be possible if the bride of Christ, that's me and that's you, each walk in obedience fully to the Lord in his call for us to consecrate ourselves in this present day, to set aside the time to come before God and to allow him to bring out all that he needs gone so that we can host his presence and carry his glory in the fullness to a world that is currently ignorant of their need for him. And it's all for him. It's for the bridegroom. Is he our Lord and is he worthy? That's for you each to work through in fullness in the quiet place, just yourselves and the Holy Spirit. But for myself, I'm aware of the painful heart issues that I still need to work through this year. We've set aside January as a time of consecration, but the more I pray, the more I think 2024 is a time for consecration. <laughs> it's going to last for as long as he, need, he needs us to be in this place. But we need to set aside the concerns of the world and instead set our eyes on him and what lies ahead, standing in his grace through it all and standing in his love to be a remnant and a bride that's pure and spotless and radiating the glory of the Lord so that many who walk in great darkness will then see a great light and we can then celebrate together in glory when we enter into the fullness of our salvation in eternity together. So I'm just going to ask you this last time as I close, is he worth it? Amen. Amen.